A masked gunman storms a church, taking a hostage and threatening to blow up the building. A parishioner fights back. The investigation crosses state lines as authorities race to find and defuse multiple bombs before they detonate. Prosecutors will have to unravel a complex murder plot to take a former FBI agent with deadly intentions off the streets. In June 1996, Northern Virginia police engage in an armed standoff following an assault at a church. The task of proving the gunman is sane and dangerous is taken up by Assistant Commonwealth's attorney, Jim Willett. This was an individual who presented a singular and unique threat of safety to the community. This wasn't a crime about someone who was criminally insane. This isn't about somebody who needed help. This is somebody who was motivated by hatred and a need for revenge Pure and simple. In this episode, some names have been changed. June 23, 1996, Prince of Peace Methodist Church in Manassas, Virginia. That night, Pastor Edwin Clever agreed to meet a man at the church to receive a food donation. He believed the church was empty. Don't move! The gun in the back of your head. The masked gunman forced the pastor toward the church office. He had obviously prepared the assault in advance. Sit down. He secured the pastor, then began interrogating him. When I was sitting in the chair and uh, he was so aggressive in his questioning and, and if I wasn't answering to suit him and he was slapping me, um, uh, I was thinking, you know, I just might not live through this. The gunman placed a pack around Clever's waist. He said it contained C4, a plastic explosive. He threatened to set it off if Clever didn't cooperate. The terrified pastor didn't know what the gunman could want. His mind raced for an explanation. The whole time I'm trying to figure out exactly what's happening. You know, what, one, what is he talking about? Two, who is he? And, and three, what is his purpose? Where is he going to with all of this? So it was really difficult to figure out what he was doing. The pastor overheard the man talking to someone on a phone. I need you to bring that car to the parking He made it appear the whole time that he was not alone, that there were other people around the building as well, um, and uh, that he had people stationed in different places, that it was a, a, a big plot. The pastor realized he could not expect any help. Only his children knew he had gone to the church. He said, this is why you're going to cooperate, because I've got somebody with your children right now. And he started describing pretty vividly what my children were probably doing at that minute. If Pastor Clever didn't follow the attacker's orders, his two teenage sons could be killed. Immediately, um, the concern was, what do I do? How can I protect my children? Um, it's easy to sacrifice myself for something. It's not easy to sacrifice myself if, I think, if I'm thinking that my children are going to be sucked in as well. Do you understand? The gunman began talking about the church's finances. You know you have somebody embezzling from your church? I don't believe that. It wasn't making any sense. Then the gunman told Clever to call the woman he said had been embezzling. He was to lure her to the church by saying another parishioner needed counseling. When the pastor refused, the gunman struck him again. He reminded Clever he had people ready to attack his sons. 
I'm thinking, what must my children be thinking? They must be terrified. Um, uh, what's going to happen to them? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking just this is already this is a horrible situation. I don't want it to be any worse. I certainly don't want them uh, to, to not survive the night. Fearing for his family's safety, the pastor made the call. Hello? Hello. This is uh, Pastor Clever. Oh, hi, Pastor Clever. When Paula Grant answered the phone, oh, the pastor wrong? apologized for calling so late. Yes, yes, I'm... Trying to hint to Paula that there was trouble, he purposely used incorrect parishioner names while following the gunman's orders. Yes, yes, it's late, but can you come? Paula agreed to meet with the parishioner who needed counseling. All right, yeah. Before leaving, she asked her sister to look after her daughter while she was gone. Okay, see you soon, thanks. Bye-bye. Paula Grant was a former FBI agent with more than a decade of federal law enforcement experience. She would go to the church, but she would go armed with a gun and pepper spray. The former agent was now a lieutenant for a local community college police department. The pastor had never called her to the church so late at night. If the pastor was in trouble, she was prepared to help him. When Paula arrived, the pastor's van was the only vehicle in the parking lot. The gunman lunged at her, but she quickly reacted with her pepper spray. Don't fight me on this! She recognized the man's voice. It was her estranged Where husband, 41-year-old Eugene Bennett. The two were in the middle of a contentious divorce. Paula tried to keep her husband at a distance with the pepper spray. When he didn't leave, she knew she had to use more force. Eugene was a former FBI agent too, well-trained in weapons and experienced in high-pressure situations. You're not gonna kill me, Gene. I'm not gonna let you do this. He tried to coax her out of the office but the former hostage negotiator did not believe he wouldn't hurt her. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. I'm not coming out. He said he was ready for a shootout. Put C4 around Edwin's waist. He threatened to blow up the building if she didn't come out. Do you have something around your waist? Yes, but I don't know what it is. Paula knew she had to stop Eugene, but he was the father of her two daughters. She fired a shot, but struck the door frame. Paula grabbed the phone, but the first line she tried was dead. She tried others and found one that worked. She kept talking to Eugene, shouting clues and hoping the operator would understand what was happening.
possibly a bomb squad? Prince William County Police Detective Ronald McClellan heard the radio call. I was working the evening shift. The call went out that there was an open phone line at the Methodist Church, and that the dispatcher on the other end could hear a scuffle in the background, something about someone having a gun uh, that sounded like a, uh, like a hostage-type situation. So patrol units responded. Not knowing where her husband was or what he would do next, Paula did not let her guard down. Edwin, stand up. Let me see the explosives. The pastor needed help. C4 is an extremely powerful explosive. From behind your back. I think so. Gently lower it to the floor. Can you push it a little further out away from you? Gently. That was scary because I wasn't sure how it was, how it would detonate or what would make it detonate or anything else. So that was, um, uh, but when I, when I got it off and laid it down, there was a certain comfort in, okay, it didn't explode yet. Can you go behind the desk and take cover? There could be some shots fired. Within minutes, Prince William County patrol officers arrived. They didn't know how many people were inside or who was armed. Police! This is the police department. Paula feared that her husband was still in the church. She told the operator she'd protect herself if Eugene came to the door. Tell us his name. Please identify yourself and walk slowly. Ma'am, this is Officer Renaud. Ma'am? This is Officer Renaud. I'm getting ready to come in the doorway now. Coming in real slow. This is me coming in the doorway, ma'am. Ma'am? Following right. police protocol, she immediately disarmed. Check on the pastor. He's in there. Because of the explosives, no, they quickly part. freed the pastor and cleared the building. Officers checked the area. Eugene Bennett was gone. When I arrived on the scene, patrol units were already there. They had the church surrounded. Paula explained what happened. While we were interviewing them, dispatcher came over the phone. It was approximately 40 minutes later, saying that they had Eugene Bennett on the telephone, and he was reporting that his wife had fired a shot at him and was trying to blow him up. Eugene Bennett was calling from his house. The detective immediately went there. The special weapons and tactics team was deployed, surrounded the house. Bennett refused to come out. He said his wife had tried to kill him, and he was worried the officers were on her side. We maintained telephone contact with Mr. Bennett, dispatchers, a patrol supervisor, and later a hostage negotiator. Bennett told the negotiator he was hearing voices and that someone inside the house would not let him leave. Mr. Bennett was talking about how his wife was trying to set him up, how she was trying to blow him up. He then would go in and claim that his name was Ed. And then he would talk about how bad Ed was. Bennett didn't trust the police. He demanded they patch the call through to his longtime friend, defense attorney Reed Weingarten. The phone rang, and it was Gene, obviously in desperate trouble. And when I got a picture of what was going on, I was extremely fearful that Gene was going to be killed. I, I mean, I just didn't have a clue what was going on. And I think the law enforcement officials in the main were trying to be helpful. They, they were trying to avoid hurting him. 
as Bennett's attorney and negotiators tried to coax him into surrendering. Investigators at the church continued to process the crime scene. Supervising the process was Prince William County Police Sergeant Robert Zinn. We had the bomb squad respond and do their search, looking for any explosive materials. They're also looking for secondary devices um, in case there might be like a booby trap or something set like that. So we want to make sure that the, the scene is safe. So once the crime scene people go in, that they can work uh, fairly freely and do what they need to do. The bomb squad needed to render the C4 safe, but they had no idea how much explosive material was in the pack or what the trigger was that would set it off. One wrong move could be deadly. In June 1996, police in Prince William County, Virginia, responded to a 911 call from a church. There they found Pastor Edwin Clever, shackled and hooded. Church member Paula Grant had made the call. She said her estranged husband, Eugene Bennett, held the two at gunpoint, threatening them with explosives. A member of the Prince William County Explosives and Ordnance Disposal Squad carefully examined the pack Bennett had placed around the pastor's waist. Bennett claimed it contained a putty-like explosive called C4 which can be triggered to explode when packages are opened. But it was harmless modeling clay. The crime scene was safe. The alleged gunman, Eugene Bennett, had called 911 from his house. He refused to come out. While on the phone with police, he sometimes claimed he was named Ed. Other times, he said Ed wouldn't let him come out. The standoff continued. At the church, crime scene investigators located a bag that Sergeant Robert Zim believed was left by the gunman. Included in the bag was a number of different items, different restraints, uh, gags, uh, things of that nature. He had other items in there that we feel as though were going to be used to inflict pain on his victims, torture them to a certain degree. Investigators found razors, syringes, tape, a knife, and five sets of keys to cars and padlocks. Checking outside the building, investigators discovered more bags. We recovered a, a dark blue uh, book bag. Subsequent examination of that book bag uh, revealed a number of plastic bags in there filled with different types of uh, uh, pieces of carpet, cloth, uh, hair, um, other materials, along with approximately two pounds of an explosive material mixture. Explosives and ordnance disposal personnel decided to destroy the mixture. We felt as though Mr. Bennett was probably going to use that material to help start or fuel a fire to help conceal his crime at the church. The explosive material was safely detonated. All the remaining evidence was taken to the Prince William County Crime Lab. Hours after the incident, the standoff with Eugene Bennett was still ongoing. At Bennett's request, the negotiator made a conference call to Bennett's friend, attorney Reed Weingarten. Uh, Gene was totally paranoid. Uh, he was slipping in and out of uh, his other self. He also uh, was fully convinced that his wife had manipulated everything and that she was going to be behind his end. And believe, he fully believed that the law enforcement officials who were surrounding him uh, were at her beck and call. I did my very best to persuade him that he had to surrender. 
After a four-hour standoff, Bennett said he was coming out. Police ordered him to exit the house unarmed. They arrested him on abduction and firearms charges. As he was taken into custody, he told officers not to worry. He had locked Ed away. A search of the house turned up no one. Police tried to interview Bennett. Though barely coherent, he mentioned a woman who was staying in a nearby hotel room to Detective Ron McClellan. Checked with the hotel management and found that the room had been uh, rented by a Marianne Khalife. A little while later, while we're conducting our investigation, we were informed by our 911 dispatchers that Marianne Khalife had called into 911 wanting to report her boss, Edwin Adams, as missing. They asked Khalife to come in for questioning. She told police that she had never heard of Eugene Bennett. She said she had worked for a man named Edwin Adams and that Adams had disappeared that day with her gun. She stated that back in February of 1996, she answered an ad in the newspaper where the individual she knew as Edwin Adams had advertised for a private investigator. She contacted Edwin Adams, who later turns out to be Eugene Bennett, and ex is hired for the job. Uh, the case was assigned to prosecutor Jim Willett. She met Mr. Bennett, and he told her that he was in charge of a private investigative agency, that he was going to build a branch of that in Northern Virginia and wanted to recruit individuals who uh, would want to work in that type of capacity with him. Her involvement from there became pretty complex. He told her that he would train her to be a private investigator and later told her that she would actually be participating in this investigation of, of a large insurance scam. When he interviewed her, he told her the scam involved a woman named Paula and the minister at the Prince of Peace Church. He had been hired to detail how they did it. As part of their investigation, Bennett had Khalife take out $1 million worth of life insurance on herself. The beneficiaries were the Bennett's two children. He told her getting the policy would help them learn how the scam worked. Trusting her new employer, she followed his instructions. Bennett also ordered Khalife to buy a specific gun and ammunition. He told her to go to a shooting range to practice. What are you talking about right here? Police believe Bennett planned to shoot Paula and the pastor, linking the murder weapon to Khalife. She said that on the day of the abduction at the church, Bennett took the gun from her. That night, he called her. He instructed her to go to the Reverend's house and set up surveillance there. She was very nervous about that. She was uncomfortable doing that, but she did it. They were in cellular phone contact with one another. This explained the call the pastor overheard. Days before, Marianne and Bennett had left vehicles in West Virginia, Richmond, and Manassas. Parking Mr. Bennett's vehicle in the city of Manassas may give him another escape route if he needed it. The Ford Contour that was in the city of Richmond was clearly his attempt to set up an alibi because he rented the vehicle in Richmond and he also obtained a hotel room in the city of Richmond. Part of his plan appears to have been that he was going to have Marianne Khalife drive to West Virginia after this incident. Her leaving the state would look like interstate flight after the murders. Investigators believe Bennett planned to kill Khalife in West Virginia and collect her insurance through his children. Weeks earlier, Bennett asked Khalife to go undercover. Prosecutor Jim Willett believed he knew why. And he had her contact his wife because ultimately he wanted people to be able to place them together, to associate them with one another for other criminal purposes. By photographing the encounter, he would have evidence of the two women together. Eugene Bennett was gonna make this look like a love triangle. 
Mary Ann Khalife being the scorned third party, shooting and killing his wife, the minister, fleeing to West Virginia, make her death appear to be an accident, and everything would point at Mary Ann Khalife. Khalife led detectives to the car she and Bennett left in Manassas. They searched the car's trunk. We came across uh, another one of these book bags, a dark blue book bag. Given the experience that we had had with the book bag that we recovered from the church, we immediately called EOD people to have them come over. Explosives and ordnance disposal experts found more bomb-making materials and rendered them safe. Investigators noted that each of the book bags had a different number of black markings. They found one bag with three slash marks and another with six. When we found the first two bags that were numbered, we were extremely concerned about tracking down at least another four bags. We felt we were going against the clock because we didn't know where these bags would be located and who would have access to these bags. Police had Eugene Bennett in custody, but until they could piece together the rest of his complex plan and find the remaining explosives, countless lives were still at risk. Authorities had former FBI agent Eugene Bennett in custody on abduction and attempted murder charges after he ambushed his wife and a minister at a Northern Virginia church. Investigating the attack, police found two book bags containing explosives. They believed as many as four more were hidden somewhere. Sergeant Robert Zinn hoped several keys Bennett left at the church would lead to the other bags. Some were padlock keys labeled with locations in the Northern Virginia area. Police realized the locations corresponded to campuses of the college where Bennett's wife worked as a police officer. They called campus police and asked them to check lockers for unregistered padlocks. Over about the next 45 minutes or an hour, we were getting calls back from the various uh, campus security offices saying, yes, they did in fact have student lockers that matched the numbers of the respective sites, and in fact that each of the lockers were now padlocked. Investigators went to each of the campus locations named on the keys. They were spread out across Northern Virginia. They had to find the missing bags and defuse any bombs they might contain. Dozens of innocent people could be in danger. At the Woodbridge campus, they found the locker and checked the key. it fit. Because of the explosives found in the other bags, they called in the Explosives and Ordnance Disposal Squad. Upon opening the, uh, the one particular locker there at the uh, Woodbridge campus, EOD people found another one of the dark blue book bags with a slash mark on it. They then x-rayed the bag through that x-ray process, they found uh, uh, what appeared to be a, a pipe bomb. They immediately evacuated the lower portion of the school area. The officers had to keep their distance. The bomb could explode at any moment. After removing the device, the EOD personnel were going to undertake a, a render safe procedure that they use customarily uh, with pipe bombs. And that process involves using kind of like a modified shotgun charge to uh, shoot the end cap off the device and then causing the contents to spill out, rendering it safe. The small charge should and have charge simply knocked the end off the pipe. Fire three, two, one, detonate. 
Instead, the bomb exploded. No one was injured, but it was clear to Commonwealth's attorney, Paul Ebert, that the device was built to kill. The bomb blew all the windows out of the college. That particular bomb, he had put nails, fish hooks on, and uh, those, those nails and fish hooks stuck in the walls. It, it shows how dangerous uh, that bomb could have been had it exploded uh, in proximity to, to any human. The pipe bomb was an improvised anti-personnel device. That even gave us cause for greater concern. We suspected that were, there were still additional bags that were out there located at the other colleges. By the time that we were done with our searches, we had five bags, and they were marked one, and then three, four, five, and six. We did not have a book bag number two in our possession at that time. Assistant Commonwealth's attorney, Jim Willett, knew that anyone near the missing bag was at grave risk. As the days progressed, that number two bag loomed larger and larger. It was a shadow over the investigation in the case. It, we really focused on that, perhaps to the exclusion of some other things that we might have looked at because of the public safety concern. Well, it looks like they've completed fracture matches. Investigators sent the five bags to a crime lab for analysis of the strips of cloth each contained. We wanted to know if we put all the pieces together that they would complete a whole article or whether we still had a piece missing. Lab technicians reported that the strips did come from a single article and that they completed the article. This led police to conclude there was no missing bag number two. For whatever reason, perhaps an attempt to mislead us, Mr. Bennett had just omitted bag number two from the series of bags that he had constructed. The Commonwealth's attorneys assigned to the case looked into the Bennett's past to determine a motive for Eugene's murder plot. The Bennett's met in 1982 and married while working for the FBI in Atlanta. In 1986, they transferred to the FBI's Washington, D.C. field office. She became involved in his plan to defraud the FBI through false moving expenses. After that, their marriage started falling apart. As their relationship began to dissolve and she developed uh, an extramarital relationship with another woman, and this became known to Mr. Bennett, and eventually they separated, divorce papers were filed, and she went to the FBI to confess the fraud that they had been involved in. A few days before she was to testify at Eugene's 1993 fraud trial, Paula went to his house to pick up their daughters. When she entered the garage, he came at her with a stun gun. She was attacked by Mr. Bennett, who subdued her, bound her, in a way very reminiscent of how he was able to take the Reverend and subdue him. Bennett held his wife captive for two days. He told her that people that he had worked with in his undercover capacity, dangerous individuals, had the children, and that they were afraid that if he were successfully prosecuted, that he would turn state's evidence on them. And so he had to be acquitted of this case so that the children would be safe. And the only way to do that would be for her to recant. At the 1993 fraud trial, Paula changed her story, but the judge learned why and sentenced Bennett to a year in prison. With Bennett now charged with attempted murder, prosecutors prepared their case. Close number they two. knew what Bennett's defense would be. In this case, their only viable option was the insanity defense because we had such strong evidence of identification that we could conclusively established he was the criminal actor. Leading Bennett's defense team was attorney Reed Weingarten. We knew that this was not the Gene Bennett that had performed such notable and noble work for the FBI. While an agent, Eugene Bennett worked undercover, infiltrating and dismantling violent gangs. 
His work had yielded more than 300 convictions and $12 million in recovered property. It was not the Gene Bennett that we saw in our offices for years. This was extraordinarily bizarre behavior. So it was immediately apparent that um, these very disturbing events had been triggered by some profound change in Gene's psychological makeup or some profound uh, illness. Bennett's past FBI work could hurt the state's case. Here's an individual who has done great service to his country, both in the military and in law enforcement, who is responsible for putting a lot of dangerous individuals behind bars at no small personal risk to himself. And that was a major concern, how sympathetic he would be um, to folks who would look upon his history with favor. The prosecution believed Bennett was a dangerous criminal. But if the defense could prove he was insane, or if the jury sympathized with him, he might never spend a day in prison. In January 1997, former FBI agent Eugene Bennett was on trial for attempted murder, kidnapping, and bomb making. Prosecuting Bennett were Commonwealth's attorneys Paul Ebert and Jim Willett. I wanted the jury to understand that this crime was about hatred and revenge, and it was not about some obscure mental illness. This case is about one thing, and that is whether the defense can establish that he crossed the line to legal insanity when he, and then we went into the, the description of the case, planned this, executed that, recruited Mary Ann, made up evidence kits, made bombs, planted bombs, lured the reverend. The jury would have to find that he did all of these things in a disassociative state over a period lasting from February through June. And it just wasn't something that we thought the jury was going to buy. But of course, you can't take anything for granted in a jury trial. We will not prove the defense team, led by Reed Weingarten, argued that their client suffered from a dissociative mental disorder. The message was this. You have a man who had a highly distinguished career in the military and in law enforcement. You, had, you have a man here who was ruthlessly efficient in the work that he did as a federal agent. Uh, juxtaposed with that, you have this ludicrous cartoon of some undercover operation. The only conclusion you can come to is that this man, during this aberrant behavior, was deeply disturbed, and that disturbance uh, was consistent with the insanity defense. Prosecution calls Edwin the first Clever. witness in the prosecution's case was Edwin Clever, Edwin Clever the, the pastor of Prince of Peace Methodist Church. Our purpose was to let the jury see, at the very beginning, an innocent bystander, if you will, someone who was caught up and ensnared by the defendant through no fault of his own and traumatized and victimized by him for his own selfish gains. And he was a compelling witness. Clever recounted how he was subdued and terrorized at the church was forced down the hallway into the offices where I was placed in handcuffs and shackles and a, a bag was placed over my head. During the ordeal, he heard the gunman talking on the phone to someone who was watching his family. Bennett knew every detail about what Clever's sons had done that night and where they were at that moment. We were able, through his testimony, to illustrate from the very beginning, give the jury just a little bit of a taste of the scope of the planning that went into this thing because of the surveillance at his house, because of the phone calls, because it was obvious that Mr. Bennett had spent an awful lot of time preparing devices, the plastic around the waist, the, the, the bag over the head, the restraints, that this was not something that he thought up shortly before he began the crime. This was something that took place over a period of time. On cross-examination, the defense had few questions for Clever. Our prevailing theme with the pastor was to get him off the stand as quickly as possible. There was uh, no way that we were going to discredit him. As horrible as the evening was, as scary as it was, I mean, thank goodness he wasn't hurt. The state called Paula Grant, Eugene's ex-wife, and the target of the alleged murder scheme. Their divorce was finalized two weeks before the trial. 
She testified that their marriage began to fall apart after they moved to Northern Virginia. Paula had an affair with another woman. When Eugene found out, he was outraged. Did you tell him that you wanted to move out? No. Why not? Because I'm, I was afraid of the reaction that he would have. Paula told the court about the 1993 incident when Eugene abducted her to stop her from testifying in the fraud case. As the prosecution was concerned, we handled her involvement in the fraud straight on. We told the jury about it from the very beginning. We wanted to expose the weaknesses, the warts, if you will, in our witnesses and, and, our, and our evidence ourselves rather than have a defense do it. To earn a decision in their client's favor, the defense had to shift the jury's sympathy away from Paula and toward Eugene. Okay. What we no attempted to show was that she had succeeded in manipulating the situation. She um, had this open uh, lesbian relationship, and on top of that, she was doing everything she possibly could to take Jean's beloved daughters from him. And I was hopeful that would cause some sympathy with the jury for Jean. Adams. The state next called Marianne Khalife to the stand. He was going to train She testified that Ben had tricked her into helping him set up his attack. Yes. We would not have had as clear a picture without Ms. Khalifa's input uh, as we did with it. She gave us, I think, most importantly, evidence of how long he planned this and how much precision went into the execution of, of, of the crimes itself, which went a long way to defeating the insanity defense because it was quite clear that despite the bizarre nature of, of his thinking, it was very clearly executed at all stages. During cross-examination, the defense questioned Khalife about the tasks Bennett assigned her. Ms. Khalife. They wanted to point out that he exhibited bizarre behavior, hoping this would help their insanity plea. The things he said to you did not make sense to you. Yes, there were times that things did not seem right. No more the prosecution rested. Now it was the defense's turn to present its case to the jury. The defense tried to support Bennett's insanity plea by calling an expert in criminal psychology. He basically said in layman's terms, as Gene just broke up, broke up into pieces. Uh, the stress, uh, the fear of losing his children, uh, the destruction of his ego caused by the breakup of his marriage and the particular circumstances attendant thereto, um, led to Gene splitting up. Dr. Bishop. The prosecution questioned the thoroughness of the doctor's assessment. Mr. Bennett had told him that the day this offense occurred, he received a distressing, troubling phone call from his little girl. Mommy's going to move away. She's going to take us away from you, he told the doctor. Uh, she was in tears. She was scared. Uh, he didn't know how to rescue her from this situation. The doctor said this phone call triggered Bennett's dissociative episode. So if, uh, of course you verify the prosecutor that. asked the doctor if he had spoken to Bennett's daughter to confirm the conversation. No. I said, well, you mean you didn't talk to her? I knew he hadn't because I had asked her had, had he talked to you. Well, no. I said, well, doctor, I have spoken with her, and I can tell you that that phone call did not take place. Would you like me to ask the court for a recess? She's in my office now. You can go down and interview her and see if this will change your opinion. No, I don't want to do that. And in my view, I think that hurt the defense of insanity because here was a chance for them to gain some independent, objective cooperation for the central things that Mr. Bennett had told his doctor that formed the basis of his opinion, and they didn't do it. The defense had to counter the damage done by the prosecution's cross. They introduced as evidence tapes of Bennett's conversations with police during the four-hour standoff on the night of the abduction. We introduced them because we thought they would be helpful for the jury to have a clear picture of his state of mind on the night in question. I, I'll never forget the evening. I, I remember my reaction to the tapes in real time. I was stunned. I concluded something was profoundly wrong, uh, and I was hopeful the tapes would have a similar impact on the jury. 
the prosecution objected, asking for a bench conference. They wanted the tapes thrown out. Clearly, Mr. Bennett on the tape was genuinely afraid. And that came through. That was genuine. And there were tears on the tape. There was hysteria on the tape. There was paranoia on the tape. And it gave a side to Mr. Bennett that the jury would not have otherwise been exposed to. Well, I'm going to overrule the objection at the present time and, um, and allow the tape to be played. The state worried that after hearing the 911 tapes, the jury might side with the defense and find Bennett not guilty by reason of insanity. In the abduction and attempted murder trial of Eugene Bennett, the jury was about to hear a tape of a 911 call Bennett made after the attack at the church. He had made the call from his house as police tried to get him to come out. On the tape, jurors heard Bennett referring to himself as an alter ego named Ed. Prosecutors wanted the tape thrown out, arguing it served as testimony that could not be cross-examined. When it was allowed, it helped support the defense claim that Bennett had multiple personalities. But prosecutor Jim Willett felt it revealed that Bennett only acted insane. It hurt the defense because he would shift in and out. He would forget to pretend, you know, during the course of this three or four hour tape. You know, he would forget who he was or who he was supposed to be and then respond to the name Gene. And we were able to point those things out, that here were these unintended moments of rationality that he didn't want us to see, but they're there and you can't ignore them. In the rebuttal phase of the trial, Commonwealth's attorney, Paul Ebert, called a clinical psychologist to clarify dissociative disorders for the jury. He was able to explain what a true multiple personality uh, is and what and why in this case uh, it didn't fit the the uh, norm for, for for such a mental disorder the prosecutor questioned dr evan stewart nelson about the nature of alter egos when people are in their alters they may engage in behavior that seems very organized for that time but it would be really implausible for someone to carry out an organized scheme aiming towards some larger goal down the road across multiple periods of time. Remember that in this disorder, folks don't really get to shift in and out of altars as they please. So they can't simply look at their calendar, see that they have an appointment with a rental car agency, or that they need to call uh, the phone company to initiate a new phone number and magically shift into that altar in order to do business. That's not consistent with the disorder. Hoping to reduce the impact of the testimony, the defense pointed out the doctor only testified about the disorder in general. He had not personally evaluated Bennett. My role was really just to educate the jury. I was there as an expert on the mental illness, and so was perfectly happy to answer whatever questions they wanted to ask. Now the witness is excused. After more than a week of testimony, the case went to the jury. They deliberated 14 hours before returning. Will the defendant please rise? On February 11, 1997, they found Eugene Bennett guilty of all nine felony charges against him, including attempted murder. The jury recommended a total of 61 years in prison. Bailiff, will you please remove the defendant from the courtroom? Citing Bennett's FBI record, the judge reduced the sentence to 23 years. He will serve his time in a Virginia state prison, not a psychiatric hospital.
Two bodies are found in a California desert community. The murders are more brutal than any the town has ever seen. Investigators follow clues that lead to one of the country's most respected military institutions. Once the killer is identified, prosecutors battle in court for years, trying to stop him from walking away from a vicious crime, a free man. Nine Palms, California. Located three hours east of Los Angeles, the desert city is home to the nation's largest Marine Corps base. When tragedy strikes 29 Palms, investigators struggle to find the person responsible for a crime that shocked veteran prosecutor Gary Bailey. It was just uh, an outrage uh, that two young girls that could be anyone's daughters uh, were just viciously mutilated. It was just a senseless act of violence that um, uh, needed to be brought to justice. At 7.40 on the evening of August 2nd, 1991, after completing a 24-hour work detail at 29 Palms Marine Base, Anthony Whitcomb and a friend returned to Whitcomb's apartment. The door was open. Mary! The living room was in disarray. His girlfriend, Mary Gonzalez, did not appear to be home. She didn't respond to his calls. When Whitcomb entered the bedroom, he discovered the body of Mary's friend, Amanda Scott, lying on the floor. Her hands were bound, and her body was covered with stab wounds. Then, in the nearby bathroom, Whitcomb found a second victim, his girlfriend, Mary Gonzalez. She was lying in a pool of blood. Whitcomb and his friend left the apartment immediately to call police. When officers arrived, they cordoned off the area. They called in homicide detectives and crime scene technicians. Among those responding was San Bernardino Sheriff's Detective Scott Franks. What we normally do at the crime scene is we make entry to actually see what we have there. And then we start from the beginning, which would be the front door, and we work our way from the door through the crime scene. That way we don't disturb anything or contaminate any evidence that may be inside. To document the evidence, crime scene technicians began photographing the area. The horrific nature of the crime pointed toward an especially disturbed killer. It was obvious that whoever did this acted in an act of rage. It was just a terrible crime scene. Also inspecting the scene was San Bernardino homicide detective Tom Neely. There were two female deceased inside. Both of them were nude. They both had multiple stab wounds, and at least one of them had, uh, had been bound. The condition of the bodies suggested the victims had been dead at least eight hours. They discovered a large kitchen knife near the body of Amanda Scott. The knife contained traces of blood. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints, but technicians found a faint shoe impression on the blade. Detectives hoped it might help them identify the killer. Throughout the apartment, crime scene technicians dusted for latent fingerprints. They recovered several from the stereo. 
need a picture of this. Investigators saw signs of a recent party. They noticed a scorecard with the initials TD and PD written on it. If there had been a party earlier that evening, it would complicate the investigation. Mm -hmm. we get they could have dozens of fingerprints to process, and police would have to identify everyone who was inside the apartment. Why don't we get some In the bedroom, take. technicians pointed out a bloody handprint above the body of Amanda Scott. Judging from the size of the print, Detectives believed it was left by an adult male, possibly the killer. The bloody palm print was um, almost like a stroke of good luck. This is a tremendous piece of evidence. The task we had at hand was making sure that we could satisfactorily recover that print and make an identification from it. To advise them on handling the evidence, investigators called in Deputy District Attorney Linda Root. The bloody handprint was very clearly a full handprint of someone with rather large hands. And at that time, they weren't sure whether they should process it by, of course, lifting prints from, from that, that wall or whether they should actually cut the wall. At that time, I made the decision to cut out the wall. Technicians removed the portion of the bedroom wall that contained the handprint. In the controlled environment of the lab, they could try to determine whose blood it was and compare the print to those of any suspects developed later. Outside the apartment, police discovered another key piece of evidence, a bloody towel. Though it was likely the towel contained the blood of both victims, detectives knew it might also contain DNA evidence from the killer. I felt that the case was going to depend very greatly on the kind of physical evidence that was being gathered at the scene. And there was an incredible amount of physical evidence in terms of shoe prints, belongings, uh, the, the weapon itself. So that my feeling was that we were going to be dealing with complicated issues of forensic evidence. To determine what happened, forensic specialists needed to match each item of evidence to someone who had been at the crime scene. Yes, sir. Anthony Whitcomb, Mary Gonzalez's boyfriend, told detectives that he spent the last 24 hours on duty at the Marine Corps base. He said he saw Mary earlier the day before but did not see her again until he discovered the bodies. His alibi checked out. Investigators took statements from everyone at the scene. We primarily just interviewed all the people that were in the apartment complex. We interviewed family members that showed up there to, to uh, eliminate any problems. We took them all to the uh, Sheriff's Department in 29 Palms to interview them there. At the station, they spoke to a neighbor of Gonzalez who claimed he saw both victims early on the morning of the murders. Now, this night at the party, what time did you get there? Around 3 a.m., he stopped by the apartment where Mary and Amanda were staying. When he arrived, they were playing cards with two men he had never met. Based on what the different neighbors said, in the interviews. We knew that there was a black male and he went by the name of Trent. There was also a friend of Mary's who was named Preston. That was really all we had to work with initially. Detectives now had two first names matching the initials found on the scorecard. Though the neighbor did not know either of the men's last names, he did provide detectives with a key piece of information. The neighbor said he and Preston left the apartment at the same time, shortly after 3 a.m. He noticed a car in front of the building. 
a white Ford Escort with Georgia plates and a Marine Corps decal displayed in the window. The two men the neighbor described might have been from the 29 Palms Marine Base. Because the investigation might involve Marines, detectives contacted the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. NCIS agent David Hertberg was assigned to act as a liaison between military and local authorities. When I was given the information by the detectives concerning the white Ford Escort and it had been seen at the apartment in question the night before, we conducted inquiries with uh, vehicle registration databases of all vehicles registered aboard the Marine Corps base. Base records showed the Ford Escort belonged to a Marine named James Bolio. Bolio was not on base, and a friend said another Marine, a man named Trent Dearborn, often borrowed the car. The name Trent was consistent with the neighbor's story. Okay. All right. Detectives All right. needed to well, talk with Dearborn, the last person believed to be with the victims alive. They learned he had left the base on leave the day after the murders. When Dearborn called the base to give them the number where he was, he learned the authorities needed to talk with him about a double murder. His commanding officer ordered him to return to base. It was a risk. Detectives didn't know if Dearborn would follow instructions or disappear forever. They had to wait and hope he showed. The next morning, Dearborn arrived at the sheriff's office. Detectives questioned him about the morning of the murders. Do you know what you're here to talk to us about? And, uh... Trenton told us that um, he had been driving the vehicle that evening. Uh, he stopped by Mary's apartment sometime around 2.30 in the morning. Uh, he knew Mary from previous occasions. He knew her boyfriend. Dearborn said that he and another Marine had gone to play cards with Mary and Amanda. His friend's name was Preston Driscoll. Dearborn confirmed that Mandy's neighbor stopped by, then left the apartment the same time as Preston Driscoll, around 3 o'clock in the morning. When Preston left, Dearborn did not want to drive drunk and decided to stay the night. I came back, there was just three of us. He said that uh, from that point, he laid down on the floor and fell asleep until sometime between 7.30 and 8 in the morning. And uh, around 8 o'clock in the morning, he left and drove back to the base. Dearborn told detectives that when he left, Mary was asleep in the living room. He did not see Amanda Scott. And when he left, he just walked out of the apartment and closed the door. He didn't lock it. Detectives had found a viable suspect. He was in the apartment around the time authorities believed the victims were killed. And he left town hours later. Dearborn agreed to give fingerprints and a blood sample. Those uh, were later uh, submitted to the crime lab and compared with the bloody palm print on the wall with other prints that were recovered inside the apartment and uh, the blood was compared to blood found at the scene. The blood processing could take weeks. Results of the fingerprint analysis might come back in hours. While forensics experts analyzed the evidence, detectives searched Dearborn's barracks. During the course of the search warrant, we were keying on the clothing that he was wearing the night he was at Mary's apartment. So we did, in fact, find that clothing and subsequently turned it over to the crime lab. 
and uh, had it checked for physical evidence for blood, hair, fibers. Some of the items had what appeared to be dried blood on them. If it was blood, investigators needed to know if it matched the victims. At the autopsy, a medical examiner confirmed that each victim died from multiple stab wounds. Counting the entrance wounds, he also made a compelling discovery. The victims were each stabbed exactly 33 times. Though examiners were unable to determine if rape had occurred, testing revealed the presence of seminal fluid. These samples could be critical in the identification and prosecution of the killer. Lab tests showed the stain on Trent Dearborn's clothes was not blood. After comparing Dearborn's prints to the handprint from the crime scene, examiners reported their findings. There was no match. The handprint wasn't Dearborn's, and he had been fully cooperative. Police released him, believing he was not the killer. It meant a vicious murderer was still out there. In a 29 Palms, California apartment, Amanda Scott and Mary Gonzalez were found brutally stabbed to death. Police had eliminated their only suspect. Hoping to shake free a new lead, detectives visited a friend of Gonzalez who lived nearby at the time of the murders. Police had been told she had information regarding a possible suspect, but was afraid to come forward. She eventually told detectives that the day before the murders, a Marine had stopped by her apartment. She said his name was Val. One of the victims, Amanda Scott, was in the apartment at the time. Something about the man made her uneasy, according to NCIS agent David Hertberg. It appeared that Amanda was uh, fearful of Val. He's approximately six foot six inches, about 215 pounds. And uh, he had apparently made moves or hit on Amanda, not only the night in question, but during previous contacts that uh, both Amanda and Val had had with each other. When Amanda told them she was scared, her friends asked Val to leave the apartment. Detectives now shifted their focus to identifying the man known as Val. The report on report. Agent Hertberg knew someone who fit the description given by Amanda's friend. The name of Valentine Underwood immediately came to my knowledge as somebody who I knew from a previous criminal investigation as well as the fact that he and I played on the same recreational basketball team within the city of 29 Palms. Hertberg's suspicions increased after reading the autopsy report which revealed each of the victims had been stabbed exactly 33 times. I had information uh, from my time when I played on the same basketball team with Underwood that he wore the number 33 uh, on his jersey during the course of all of our basketball games. We verified that information with the uh, 29 Palms Park and Recreation League. Underwood was a Gulf War veteran with a clean record. Agents could not find him on the Marine base. They learned he was at a basketball tournament at Norton Air Force Base, 175 miles south of 29 Palms. NCIS agents traveled to the base expecting to find Valentine Underwood. How long ago was that? Oh, maybe 15 minutes. But he wasn't at the pregame practice. The coach said Underwood had been scheduled to play but he complained of a hand injury earlier that day. That morning, Underwood had trouble handling the ball due to the injury. He told the corpsman he cut it on a razor while cleaning out a garbage can the previous day. 
Go, go ahead and go with him over there. And come on back when you're through. Let me know what's going on. Agents had doubts about Underwood's explanation. We obviously had two victims with multiple stab wounds. We had a knife that was left on the scene uh, that did not have a hilt on it, so someone could have cut themselves. We're starting to put together that uh, Valentine might be more of a, a suspect in this investigation. Investigators found Underwood at the Naval Hospital, where he was recovering from nerve damage to his hand. They told him they were investigating a double murder in 29 Palms and asked if he would answer some questions. He was released from the hospital and agreed to go with them. The detectives escorted Underwood back to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. Before being interviewed, Underwood agreed to give fingerprints and a blood sample. Examiners began testing while the suspect was questioned by Detective Tom Neely. We had a lot of information about him going into the interview. We knew that he knew at least one of the girls. We knew that he'd been uh, to the girl's apartment on previous occasions. Essentially, the strategy we had was to go in and sit down with him and uh, find out if he'd tell us the truth. They also needed to lock him into a timeline for his actions the night of August 1st and the morning of August 2nd when the murders occurred. He said that on the 1st, he met a woman in a club and slept at her house that night. At 5.30 the next morning, he returned to base for physical training. Around 8 o'clock, he went back to the house where he slept. At 9.15, he withdrew some cash from an automated teller machine, then visited some friends in Amanda and Mary's apartment complex. He said he stayed there for a short period of time and then ended up walking back out to the main street where he ran across a female that he used to date, and that female gave him a ride back to the base. That was at 10 a.m. So he had a, a very long, drawn-out explanation of what he did, a lot of details. Knowing the blood work could take weeks or even months, examiners focused on the latent print evidence they had to get an answer to detectives quickly. Without more evidence, the suspect would have to be released soon. His alibi had some holes, but Underwood answered all of the detectives' questions. First of all, he repeatedly denied being in the victim's apartment on August 2nd, the morning of the murders. Police didn't have enough to make an arrest. And without lab results linking Underwood to the crime scene, they could not hold him much longer. As technicians worked to compare the prints, detectives feared they might have to release a man who may have been involved in a brutal double slaying. In August 1991, Mary Gonzalez and Amanda Scott were brutally slain. At the crime scene, police recovered a knife and a bloody handprint. For several hours, Marine Lance Corporal Valentine Underwood was questioned about the day of the crime by Detective Tom Neely. We essentially locked him into a timeline as to what he did, when he did, where he did, and uh, from that point, we were ready to start verifying his alibi. Detectives knew they would have to release Underwood soon. They believed he was involved in the crime, but they could not hold him without direct evidence. To find that evidence, forensic specialists worked during the interview. They compared Underwood's prints with the bloody handprint found at the crime scene. Checking comparison points on the fingers and heel of the hand, 
they determined the prints were a match. At that point, we knew we had some significant information and a very critical piece of evidence that linked Underwood to this case uh, more strongly than any other person we, we dealt with up to now. He just received some news. When detectives learned of the forensics results, they immediately arrested Valentine Underwood for the stabbing murders of Amanda Scott and Mary Gonzalez. Recalling the shoe print left on the murder weapon, detectives requested a comparison between the print and Underwood's shoes. Technicians reported the shoes were consistent with the one that left the print. Deputy District Attorney Linda Root now had solid physical evidence against Underwood. I had every, every feeling that the evidence available to me at that time would prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Valentine Underwood was the person who killed both of the young women. However, before a trial could get underway, defense attorneys called for Root's removal from the case. Because I had been at the scene, uh, the defense attorney had indicated that he would call me as a witness. So basically they brought a motion, uh, what we call a recusal, which means motion to have, have the district attorney's office removed from the case or me personally removed from the case. The move showed the defense was ready to battle for their client. The defense attorney at the time is certainly an attorney who leaves no stone unturned and leaves no tactic unexplored. The state did not want to get mired in pretrial motions. The case was reassigned to San Bernardino Deputy District Attorney Gary Bailey. Mrs. Root felt that the best thing for the case was for her to recuse herself and let some other uh, deputy district attorney try the case. So that's exactly what happened. Two months later, DNA experts completed their tests. The results showed that the semen that was found in the victims was Underwood's. That particular evidence showed that the chance of it being someone else's semen was one in three million. So that was very powerful evidence for us. Bailey was ready to begin the trial of Valentine Underwood. But in a lengthy pretrial battle, Underwood's defense attorney fought hard to have the case dismissed. He filed more than 20 motions, uh, almost every motion known to man. He attacked every piece of evidence that we had. He challenged the venue or the location that the trial was going to be in. He moved to suppress the, the actual physical evidence that we had in the case, the fingerprints, the blood, the semen that was recovered. Uh, he attacked and tried to suppress the, the statements that Underwood gave to the detectives. The defense's delay tactics kept the case tied up for six years. But Bailey fought every motion. All I could do was just react to whatever he did. And that's typically what happens in a criminal trial. The defense counsels control the case prior to trial. Once the trial starts, that's when we uh, begin taking control of the case. To get the case before a jury, the prosecutor could not give up. He knew the evidence could survive the delay, but worried about witnesses. Where the time had the adverse effect was our witnesses, a lot of the witnesses that were Marines, were getting out of the service. They were going back home, and we were now going to have to do out-of-state subpoenas. From a logistic standpoint, it was just a nightmare. Naval Criminal Investigative Service agent David Hertberg used federal resources to keep track of the witnesses. We also worked throughout the entire six and a half year process of the court proceedings with the Sheriff's Department and the District Attorney's Office in coordinating uh, the location of possible witnesses for individuals who had gotten out of the Marine Corps 
and had left the 29 Palms area. We conducted a number of interviews, inquiries, investigative steps throughout the country. With each passing year, it grew more difficult to maintain contact with witnesses. Prosecutors also feared the witnesses' memories were fading. Without reliable witness testimony, they might not be able to present a successful case, and Valentine Underwood would be released. In August 1991, the murders of Amanda Scott and Mary Gonzalez shocked the desert community of 29 Palms, California. Investigators believe Marine Lance Corporal Valentine Underwood was the killer. But for years, Underwood's defense team worked to get the case dismissed through pretrial motions. Deputy District Attorney Gary Bailey fought back, arguing against each of the defense's 28 motions to dismiss. This was the first case that I had ever had that had so many motions attached to it. Of course, my obligation is to respond to each and every one of them, whether they're meritorious or not. We knew we were going to win the majority of the motions because we felt they were just a lane in nature. But nevertheless, we still had to have a hearing. We still had to call witnesses. We still had to arrange for those witnesses to be present. And that took a tremendous amount of time. The prosecutor's endurance paid off. After more than six years, the defense exhausted their motions. Judge Rufus, no, and a judge right. ordered the trial to begin on October 14, 1997. In his opening, the prosecutor explained what he believed the evidence would prove happened on the morning of the murders. It's my belief that sometime after 9.15, Underwood walked into that apartment, uh, the door being left open. The prosecutor believed Underwood turned up the stereo, leaving his prints there. He found Amanda Scott asleep. When she ran, he followed and subdued her. I believe that uh, he bound uh, Amanda Scott and uh, silenced her. That was evidenced by her hands were bound uh, behind her with a telephone cord and there was a garment around her neck. Uh, I then believe that Mr. Underwood uh, confronted Mary Gonzalez in the bathroom. There was blood all over the bathroom uh, area. I believe that he then uh, uh, raped and killed Mary Gonzalez. On the morning of August and then I believe he walked over uh, to Amanda Scott again. I believe he then raped uh, Amanda Scott, and after he was finished, I believe he stabbed her 33 times. I think that's the best explanation for the evidence, the forensic evidence that we found in the case. You also hear evidence that the defense... The defense chose to withhold its opening statement until the state rested. And that he was treated Free to continue, the prosecutor needed to explain the timeline of events the day of the crime, stating that the murders took place between 9.15 and 10.45 on the morning of August 2nd. I knew timelines were going to be important in the case. So what we did is we, we called witnesses that would establish the timelines of the victims themselves. Yes, I did. The prosecution called Trent Dearborn, one of the last people known to have seen the victims alive. Can you tell us what you did on the night of August the 1st, 1991? Uh, I borrowed a friend's car and went out to 29 Palms. The prosecution wanted the jury to see Dearborn as an honest, believable witness, knowing that the defense would later attempt to blame him for the murders. Did you kill Amanda Scott or Mary Gonzalez? No, sir, I didn't. During cross-examination, Dearborn admitted to being alone with the victims at the apartment that morning. Did you check into the base? It was roughly 8 o'clock in the morning. And you did sign in? No, sir. The defense pointed out his alibi could not be corroborated, suggesting he had something to do with the murders. It's been a while since I was in the service, but everything's changed. 
Yes, sir, it has. Thank you. Next, the prosecution wanted the jury to hear about the strange similarity in the wounds of each victim. They called the medical examiner to testify. Did you come to a conclusion as to the number of stab wounds that you observed to the body of Amanda Scott? Yes, it came to a total of 33. He said Mary Gonzalez suffered exactly the same number of wounds. The medical examiner stated that such consistency in the number of wounds in two victims is highly unusual. This, the particular kind of knife that... The prosecution then focused on the murder weapon. Be consistent with that kind of wound? Yes, this knife is certainly consistent. He testified that the butcher knife found in between the two victims was exactly the type of instrument that caused those particular wounds. The medical examiner testified that the stab wounds showed signs of extreme force. Using a prop knife, he demonstrated how such forceful strikes would have penetrated through the victims' bodies. It was a left-handed. Uh, the significance of that was that we believe the killer injured himself uh, with the murder weapon because when the knife went through Mary Gonzalez, it stuck in the floor, and we believe the, the hilt of the knife uh, went into Mr. Underwood's hand. And sliding down. The prosecution then showed jurors a photograph of Valentine Underwood's injured hand. They, of course, would try to to show that possibly it could have been caused by some other instrument other than that particular butcher knife. He allowed for that possibility, but he testified that if it wasn't that knife, it was one very, very similar to it. The defense and the state then battled over the significance of the 33 stab wounds. Now regarding the they also tried to impeach the actual number of stab wounds that he found, uh, indicating that possibly one could be 34 and one could be 33. He was pretty adamant that each of the girls were stabbed 33 times. Mr. Herbert. To explain the link between the number 33 and the defendant, the prosecution called NCIS agent David Hertberg who had played basketball with Underwood on a recreation league before the killings. He had wore the number 33 on his jersey for all of our basketball games between late April and I believe into early June. It was considered the possibility that the number 33 was significant in some manner to Valentine Underwood, uh, which might have led as a premeditated act when he committed the murder and uh, inflicted 33 stab wounds to both victims. The prosecution then called Sarah Brame to the stand. As part of his alibi, Underwood claimed he was with Brame hours before the murders. I do. The prosecutor asked about that night. She testified that after she met Mr. Underwood in a bar, they danced, they had drinks together. Later on, I asked him if he wanted to come back to my apartment for some more drinks. She took him to her apartment uh, out in the 29 Palms area. Ooh, that was close. That was really no close. Cigar. Oh, I don't get, all right. Her girlfriend and her girlfriend's boyfriend had retired for the evening and gone to bed. She testified that she was playing uh, quarters with Mr. Underwood in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drink that thing. Yeah. I drank it. She then testified that he made some advances towards her. Yeah, I when she refused Underwood's advances, he became enraged, grabbing her and holding a knife to her neck. Her girlfriend heard her scream, came out to see what was wrong, and Mr. Underwood indicated that uh, he was just playing. Since the incident occurred hours before the murders, the prosecutor asked about Underwood's hands, which he claimed he injured the day before. Did you ever see him bleeding from his hands, or did you see bandages uh, while he was playing quarters with you? No, I did not. Then, the defense attorney questioned Brame about the time she spent with Underwood after he pulled the knife. And other than that, all your contact with him, would you say he has been a gentleman in your mind? 
Yes, I would have said, I, I'd say that he was a perfect gentleman up until that point. In fact, you felt so comfortable with him that you left the house with him. Isn't that right? Yes, I did. And in fact, you felt so comfortable after the incident that you stayed around and talked to him for an hour or so and, and drank more beer. Yes, we did. Um, I can't remember if we dozed off and drank a little more. I don't really remember. Court, thank you for your testimony. You may step down. The prosecution then called experts to testify about DNA evidence. That is the top Introducing the blood found on a towel at the crime scene. What results did you come up with? The DNA expert testified that blood samples extracted from the towel matched the blood sample from Valentine Underwood. The jury also heard the DNA expert testify about examinations of the seminal fluid retrieved from the victims. It was obvious that this was a sexual assault case. In proving sexual assault cases, we used uh, uh, blood serology testing. And really all that does is tell you whether or not a person is included or excluded as a possible donor. The expert told the jury that Underwood could not be excluded. And the chance of the fluid coming from anyone else was one in three million. Underwood's attorney asked if DNA tests could prove the victims had been raped. That means that you can't tell whether it was voluntary sex, rape, or either. That's correct. Sir, for your testimony. Since the defense hadn't denied the DNA was Underwood's, the state believed they would try to explain its presence during their case. After four weeks of the state's presentation, the defense was ready to give their opening statement, offering the jury an entirely different picture of the events of the morning in question. My client will be asked to testify regarding his statement to the officers. The defense contended that Valentine Underwood was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. He will then go through his testimony. They claim that he discovered the victims in the apartment, and after trying to help them, he ran because he was afraid. His fear. He did not kill those girls. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. To support their claims, the defense called the Gulf War veteran to the stand. They began by explaining his hand injury. Yeah, uh, I was on cleaning duty. Uh, I was cleaning out a trash can, I had my hand in there. So as I was coming out, I felt something hit my hand. It, it didn't really hurt at first, but as I pulled it out and I looked, I had a razor edged and angled out of my hand. Underwood's attorney reintroduced the photo of the defendant's hand, explaining the injury was consistent with the razor wound. The defense then asked Underwood about his relationship with Amanda Scott and Mary Gonzalez. Have you ever dated Mary? We spent time together, yeah, yeah. We, we dated, we spent a lot of time together. In a surprising change to his story, Underwood now claimed that he knew both of the girls, testifying that he was even involved in an intimate relationship with Mary Gonzalez. Underwood's attorney then had to counter the powerful DNA evidence that linked his client to the crime scene and the victims. The attorney asked about the night before the murders. Did you talk to Mary? Uh, yes, I had went by there actually. Uh, she told me to come by, come in. So I came in, uh, we started talking, started playing and joking like we normally do. His story changed dramatically, according to prosecutor Gary Bailey. Mr. Underwood then testified that it was uh, earlier in the evening when he was over at the victim's apartment. Uh, he had consensual sexual intercourse with both of the victims. And the next thing I remember, Amanda came in. Mm -hmm. And after Amanda came in, what happened? She sat down, we struck up a little conversation. And she started telling me about how she remembered me from a party that I had attended. Did you, uh, did you have sex with her? Yes, sir. Yes, I did. 
His testimony was a blow to the state's DNA evidence. The jury knew he had sexual relations with the victim. So from that perspective, the DNA evidence wasn't that uh, compelling. Underwood then testified that he returned to the victim's apartment you, the following uh, morning. Mayor, a man. Hello? Hello, Mary? Hello? He testified that he walked in, found the girls in their condition, both being naked, that he was horrified, uh, that he walked over to Amanda, uh, felt her pulse, and must have got blood on his hand. Uh, he stood up. Uh, that's probably when he left his hand on the wall. Uh, he decided that he was going to call law enforcement, uh, decided against that because there was two young ladies that had just been murdered. He became afraid. He wiped off his hands on something. He left the apartment and went back to the base. Underwood's version of events accounted for all the evidence the state had presented. If the prosecution could not refute his story, an accused killer would likely go free. In 1997, Valentine Underwood stood trial for the murders of Mary Gonzalez and Amanda Scott. His testimony had severely damaged the state's case. Next, the prosecutor would try to use Underwood's own words against him. Reading from Underwood's original statement taken by detectives, prosecutor Gary Bailey asked the defendant about each fact, returning to the timeline of events already established. We were going to counter the defense's uh, theory of the case by showing that Mr. Underwood could not be believed. The state reviewed Underwood's testimony regarding his injured hand, pointing out he had given police several different versions of how he cut it. The first one was that he was cleaning the latrine and cut it on a trash can. His second uh, version was that he had actually received the cut while involved in a traffic accident. And his third version was that he received the cut on his hand uh, while slamming a basketball on the goal. Of course, these three separate versions were inconsistent, and they just bolstered the prosecution's case that everything that came out of this man's mouth was a lie. Uh, again, remembering his interview with homicide detectives, where he told three and a half hours of lies, of, of not knowing these girls, not being there. He was now going to have to take the stand, deny all of that. So my tactic was I was going to go over each one of these lies and find out just how many times he lied to the officers. And by his own admissions, he lied more than 100 times. In fact, At the conclusion of Underwood's testimony, the defense rested. The case went to the jury. Will the defendant please rise? After deliberating two full days, they returned. The fate of the defendant lay in which story the jury believed. We the jury. Underwoods the or the state's. Valentine Underwood, guilty. The jury's verdict came back. They, they found Mr. Underwood guilty of two counts of first degree premeditated murder. Nearly seven years after the murders of Mary Gonzalez and Amanda Scott, Underwood was sentenced to life in prison. I think, first of all, it was important to give the victim's family some closure. Uh, to let them know that uh, the person that did that to their little girls um, had finally been brought to justice. And secondly, to prevent this evil man from ever doing something like this again. Valentine Underwood will never be eligible for parole.